Welcome to the Cheating Secrets channel. We hope you enjoy today's story. This year we celebrated Thanksgiving with my wife's family. For the last 18 years, it always took place at our home, but now, with the boys gone, everything has changed. Josh went to Alabama and Jordan chose Auburn. I think they did it on purpose, just to ensure there's always an ongoing conflict in the family. It was kind of a tradition and always fun. For the last 15 years, I've worked as an insurance claim regulator and I absolutely hated it. I always wanted to do something outdoors and with manual labor. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to work at a desk anymore. The family situation made me a slave to my job. Connie never worked. For the past few years, the boys have been very active in sports and other activities. I became an involved parent, while Connie was more reserved but supportive. Since I spend more time with the boys, she spends more time with her parents. Connie's parents were in their late 60s. They still had strong health but were beginning to feel the stress associated with aging. Every couple of years, they spent Thanksgiving with us, but we never went to theirs. The weekend was expected to be very calm. The weather was wonderful, so the two-hour trip went quite well. Connie's dad and I enjoyed chatting, while Connie and her mom were busy preparing dinner. There were only four of us, and everything went quite well. The food was delicious, and the company was pleasant. Frank, Connie's dad, and I were looking forward to a long evening spent watching football and drinking cold beer. Connie's mom just wanted to be left alone with her new Patterson novel. John, if you don't mind, I'm going to spend the day with Harriet Miller from high school. I haven't seen her in over 10 years. You and dad will be okay, right? We'll be fine, dear. Stay as long as you want, but don't drink any alcohol. I smiled and waved her off to the door. Connie's mother, Teresa, was just finishing cleaning when I grabbed a couple of fresh long necks for myself and Frank. Where did Connie run off to, John? I think she said she was going to visit an old friend, Harriet Miller, I suppose. That's nice. She'll probably stay there most of the evening. She gave me a strange smile. She said she would return later in the evening. It was a leisurely quiet evening. Teresa settled down with her book in the living room, while Frank and I tried to get into the football games, but without much success. John, could you grab a couple of bottles of beer from the fridge? I think we need to talk. When I returned, Frank had just closed the door between the office and the living room. What did you want to talk about, Frank? First off, I think you should know that Harriet Miller died of colon cancer about six months ago. I have no idea why Connie said she was going to visit her. She might as well have picked the name of someone who isn't dead. I didn't react to what he said. I'm not sure, but I think it's some kind of joke between Connie and her mother. It seems they have some little secrets I'm not privy to. Are you saying there's something shitty going on that I don't know about? Exactly. It's been going on for the last five years or so. That's why Connie has been visiting us so often. What exactly are you trying to say? I'm a bit lost. When Connie comes to visit us lately, she doesn't stay here. I don't know where she goes, but I was very explicitly told not to stick my nose in it. Are you saying that Connie is doing something she shouldn't be doing, and her mother is helping her with it? I knew you were a smart guy. I finished my beer, and we both pretended to be interested in the ball game. We didn't talk about it anymore. Time passed. Frank started nodding off, and I caught myself wondering what my wife was actually up to. I pulled out my cell phone and started fiddling with it. Connie had turned off her, find my phone, app. I tinkered with it a bit, but to no avail. I didn't try to call her but assumed her phone was still on. I wondered how the cops always managed to find a cell phone when I couldn't. I made some fresh coffee. Frank fell asleep in his chair. Teresa covered him with a blanket when she went to bed. Connie finally came home. So, how was Harriet? I tried to sound nonchalant. She's fine. They've remodeled the whole house, now that their kids are gone. It looked nice. The problem is, I drank too much wine. I shouldn't have driven home. I didn't respond. John, I'm really tired. I'm going to take a quick shower and go to bed. We'll talk in the morning, okay? I filled a thermos with fresh coffee. I also slipped Connie's mobile phone into my pocket. As I was leaving, I heard Frank's whisper. Go get them, tiger. I didn't understand what he meant, but it brought a smile to my face. There was no real plan, so I just sat there, waiting for the engine to warm up. Eventually, I decided to try using the car's GPS system. Whatever it took, 
I hope to get something out of it besides searching for the nearest McDonald's. I went into the navigation history and selected breadcrumbs. Yes, it was all there. I had a beautiful little line of red dots showing me where my loving wife had been that day. I had no idea where Harriet lived, but it didn't matter. All I needed to do was follow the yellow brick road. I mean, the road with red dots. Fifteen minutes later, I was in a dimly lit neighborhood in front of a small brick house with a one-car garage. This had to be the place because the dots here turned around and started heading back. I took out my phone and went to maps. It took a bit of maneuvering, but after a few minutes, I realized I was right in front of 321 David Drive. If I knew what I was doing, I could figure out everything else in minutes. I didn't know what I was doing, but I stumbled upon it and found out that the house belonged to Henry Parker. Henry Parker was a school friend of Connie's and, if I remember correctly, even took her to the prom. So, she visited an old friend and spent some time with him. It doesn't necessarily mean they spent the afternoon actively having sex. It might have been the case, but I had no proof. All I had was enough to slightly upset my marriage. I hated being halfway into this mess. I was going to just head back home, but at the last minute, I decided to continue collecting breadcrumbs. It turned out to be the right decision. Apparently, Connie didn't go straight to Henry's house. She stopped at a local pharmacy along the way. So, what could I do with this information? I turned on the car's interior light and looked around for an empty paper bag or receipt. I found nothing. Connie, of course, was a creature of habit. She never paid in cash. She always used her credit card. I turned on her phone and tapped on the bank icon. Everything worked as it should. The purchase history led me straight to the pharmacy, and I immediately got a copy of the purchase made today at 3.45 p.m. My loving wife bought a pack of condoms for $7.89 and a tube of anal lubricant for $10.77. There were 12 condoms in that pack. I hoped she didn't waste her money. Now I had enough information. I could go home, but there was something else I needed to do. First, I saved a copy of the pharmacy receipt as a JPG file. Then I went into the phone settings. I wasn't very good at this kind of thing, but I kept at it until I succeeded. I set the picture of the receipt as the wallpaper. Then I made it the default for her phone. Now, whenever she opened her phone, it would be the first thing to pop up. I was sure she wouldn't have a problem getting rid of it, but not before she realized that I was fully aware of what she had done. I also sent a copy of the photo to myself. Twenty minutes later, I was back home. Frank was still sleeping in his chair. I assumed Teresa was upstairs in bed, and my loving wife was soundly asleep in the guest room. I quietly gathered all my things and headed down the stairs. I left Connie's cell phone on the kitchen table along with my wedding ring. There was no note. I didn't feel it was necessary. I was ready to leave through the door when I saw my father-in-law at the entrance. How did it go, John? As you expected. He smiled and gave me a slight wave. Five hours later, I was home. Another five hours, and I was on my way to Florida. No more crappy job, no more crappy weather and no more cheating wife. I was tempted to stop by and see the boys, but I decided against it. For some strange reason, I found myself in Baldwin County, Alabama, not Florida. It seems like there are hundreds of abandoned trailers around here. Retirees buy trailers, then pass away. Then their heirs have to keep paying for the lot and utilities until they're sold. Sometimes it takes years, so there were plenty of rental options available. Within a week, I had a new address, new driver's license, and new bank account. All my accounts in Pennsylvania were closed. After filing a declaration of domicile, I contacted Alabama and Auburn to change the boys' residency status. I transferred all the money from all accounts and even from the boys' college funds. Since I'm a nice guy, I paid off all credit cards before closing them. Connie still had a store card. I canceled the insurance on Connie's house and car. The car was in her name, as was her cell phone. I was going to cancel the utilities, but at the last minute, I changed my mind. I wasn't hiding, but I didn't let anyone know where I was. I won't bore you with the details of all the other routine actions that were necessary. You've heard this story a hundred times. I called each of the boys and explained the situation as best I could without coming off as a fool. They were upset and didn't understand, but they seemed to come to terms with it. I got a job at a shipyard, scraping boat hulls. They weren't interested in hiring me officially because of insurance, so I ended up working off the books. 
It didn't matter since I didn't care if anyone found me. I wasn't breaking any laws. I got a $10 a month gym membership at the nearest fitness center. I had no desire to sign up for a gym, but I needed a decent place to shower after work. The bathroom facilities in the rented trailer were barely adequate. After showering, I usually ate out or took something to go. The routine settled in quickly, and I was a happy nomad. Frank, it's me, John. Just thought I'd check in and see how things are going. Hey, man, good to hear from you. How long has it been? Almost four months? Almost. I've been busy, just settling in. My phone has been off almost this whole time. I only turn it on when I need to use it, mostly to order takeout. So what the hell are you doing? I rented a small trailer and got a job at one of the local boatyards. I've already lost almost 10 kilograms without even dieting. The boys are coming for spring break. I'm looking forward to seeing them, but I don't want to explain why I left. We'll see how it goes. Well, I'm glad to hear you're doing well. Everything's gone downhill here. Has your wife been in touch? Frank. I haven't heard a word from her. Not a single message has popped up on my phone. Honestly, I expected to be bombarded with angry calls, but I didn't get a single one. The only messages I got were spam calls. What the hell is going on? I heard Frank's laughter on the other end of the line. John, you won't believe this. Connie and her mother actually celebrated for a whole week after you left. The first thing Teresa did was take down your wedding photo from the mantelpiece and hang up an old photo of Connie and Henry going to prom. I didn't even know she kept that picture. Well, I expected some backlash, but not this. I guess everyone's happy now? Well, not exactly. The chickens came home to roost when Connie got back home. She couldn't even pay the utility bills, let alone the mortgage. Everything went to hell pretty quickly. The house is going back to the bank next month. She still owes for the utilities. Hell, she can't even pay her store account. How is she living? She was going to move in with us, but at the last minute decided to move in with Henry. I felt relieved by that. She was mad you closed all the bank accounts, but not mad enough to contact you about it. Henry seems more than willing to support her. Frank and I chatted for a few more minutes. I promised to call again when the boys went back to school. I had mixed feelings about all of this. On one hand, I was happy to come out unscathed, but on the other, I was a bit upset that she felt absolutely no remorse. Perhaps I was wrong. The boys stayed for a week, but honestly, they spent most of their time at Gulf Shores or Panama City Beach. They refused to enter into any discussions about the marriage. They said Connie had called each of them once, told them I had left, and didn't provide any further explanations. They hadn't heard anything else about her. They were glad to hear that I could still afford their education. I told them to get Alabama driver's licenses and use my address. I had no personal life. I didn't go to bars. All the waitresses at the restaurants I frequented were either too young, too old, or too desperate. I started working out at the gym just because I was bored and looking for something to do. But it was nothing like what you read in erotic stories. Certainly, not much was happening where I lived either. I think 90% of my neighbors were on social security. I got hooked on YouTube videos. Two years passed. No one ever knocks on my door, especially on a Sunday morning. Eventually, I decided I had to find out who it was, just to shut them up. It was Frank. Damn, Frank, how the hell did you find me? I stopped by Jordan on my way here. He showed me the way. Couldn't find Josh. Got any cold beer for a weary traveler? It's six in the morning. Wouldn't coffee be better? Got any? I had enough supplies on hand to make a decent breakfast. One of my many shortcomings. We chatted and ate until I asked the main question. What the hell are you doing here? I ran into a bit of trouble and felt it was time to leave Keystone State. I didn't respond. Frank leaned back in his chair a bit and tried to get comfortable. Connie and Henry got married on Saturday morning. I didn't even know I was divorced. That's interesting, but it doesn't sound like a reason to leave. While everyone was at the church, I went and burned down Henry's house. Now that sounds very interesting. How did it all go? I don't know. I haven't seen them since. Well, since you're here, I suppose they'll just have to move in with Teresa right now? Hardly. I gave him a quizzical look. I burned down my own house just before leaving. And then another surprise. Josh and Jordan showed up. What did I do to deserve this visit? Frank and I helped them bring in their bags. We were actually trying to figure out where Grandpa disappeared to. 
This was my best guess. Josh decided he was going to Mexico. I take it you both were at the wedding? Yes. It was crazy. Not what we expected at all. Jordan looked like he was trying to hold back laughter. Frank nudged me with his elbow. John, I think your boys are pulling one over on us. I pulled out four beers from the fridge. So, how do you like your new stepdad? This made both of them snicker. What the hell is so funny? They never got married, dad. In the middle of the ceremony, someone called to say Henry's house was on fire. Everything stopped when he ran out to see what was happening. By the time it all settled down, we found out that grandma and grandpa's house was on fire too. Mom kept trying to get Henry to finish the ceremony, but eventually, he got mad, yelled that the wedding was off, and stormed out. We had nowhere to stay, so we came straight here. So, they never got married? No. Josh and Jordan stayed with us for a few days, then returned to school. A few people came looking for Frank, but I managed to redirect them to Ocala. After a few weeks, they stopped coming. Frank got a job at a building materials store, and life got a lot more interesting. He was a bit more sociable than I, so in a short span of time, I actually started to have a personal life. Out of the blue, we started going to cooking classes, bar parties, and birthdays. We were even invited to funerals and a couple of weddings. That's where I met R.G. Sue Baker. R.G. was a divorced woman who worked in the gardening department of the building materials store with Frank. After running into her at various events several times, we sort of became a couple. One thing led to another, and six months later, she moved into the trailer with me after Frank moved out. He found a wealthy widow who had a condo in Orange Beach. R.G. and I didn't get married, but we bought the trailer together. She convinced me to quit my job at the shipyard, and now we both work at the building materials store. Isn't love grand? Thank you for being with us and listening until the end. If you found it interesting, please subscribe, give us a like, and leave your comments. And we'll see you on the Cheating Secrets channel.